You're listening to Dark Matter Radio with your host, Bonnie. Brothers and sisters, Halito, Great Grand Rising. This is Dark Matter Radio, and this is your host, Ronnie McLean. And tonight we're going to be talking about something that has come up, but hasn't really been flushed out. But um, we people are talking about it, but there aren't any real uh, articles or any real YouTube videos about black people, so-called black people so-called African-Americans, copper-colored people, Negroes, American Indians, Aboriginals, or indigenous people being prisoners of war. Now, for the white people who are listening, what's happening right now is is that we do have an understanding. When I say we, we, the so-called black people in the United States of North America, have an understanding that 98% of us were already here before you came on that supposed date of 1942, 18, I mean, um, 14, 1492. So before that date, there were aboriginals and indigenous dark-skinned people ruling the land, right? Now, what you call the Native Americans, they were here, um, but they didn't really have any power in this land so they weren't in control they weren't in control they were mainly on the outskirts so for the purpose of this conversation we're not going to be bringing up um maybe slightly native americans those are what you call your indians of today right so when you look when you look in the uh, papers and you and you bring up a name indian if it doesn't have negro black or aboriginal behind it you'll find that what the indians look like Right. Uh, They don't look like the Indians of yesterday, but they are the Indians of today. That's what they are. So just just to get that straight. So the, the question is. Prisoners of war. Right. So now we have um, our, 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 our black people, African-Americans, as they call them. Indigenous people, copper colored people, are they actually prisoners of war? And so, and it's important for us to make this distinction because we have this African descendants of slaves, uh, slaves of African descendants. All of these things are really, really important when we have when we begin to start talking about uh, reparations, recompense, um, have, getting land rights back, decolonization. You know, are, are, it, it's very important for us to really make this distinction um, as we begin to start looking at this. And then you have to think about why are some of these distinctions, these new acronyms coming up now as we begin to start talking about quote unquote reparations. So let us take a look at what a prisoner of war is. A prisoner of war, POW is a person, whether combatant or non-combatant, who is held in custody by a belligerent power during or immediately after an armed conflict. The earliest record and usage of this phrase, prisoner of war, was guess when? 1660. Right? 1660. Now, remember, the first slaves that actually came into the Americas was in 1619, 1620. And there were approximately 20 of them that got off the boat, right? That actually came from what they say Africa. Now, again, we're going to get into what is actually an African slave, 
uh, in just a minute, right? And did the Africans really sell themselves into slavery? But as we talk about this prisoner of war, it's the belligerents hold prisoners of war in custody for a range of legitimate, legitimate and illegitimate reasons, such as isolating them from the enemy combatants, Meaning that why they are at war, why the two sides are at war, they'll take people, they'll, as, they, as they are winning or capturing people, they're taking them out of, out of combat, trying to make the other side weaker. Such as isolating them from enemy combatants still in the field, releasing and repatriating them in an orderly manner after hostilities demonstrating military victory, punishing them, persecuting them uh, uh, for war crimes, exploiting them for their labor, exploiting them for their labor, recruiting and or conscripting them as their own combatants, Buffalo soldiers, collect, collecting military and political intelligence from them, or indoctrinating them in a new political or religious belief system such as Christianity or the governmental entities that had formed called the Corporation or the United States of America. So that is a prisoner of war. So let's, 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 let's see how somebody becomes a prisoner of war. So somebody becomes a prisoner of war, you know, it, it, you have to think about it. There is no war and on a certain land. Uh, these people are walking around, you know, and, and they're not bothering anybody. They're just, you know, hanging out, doing their thing. Take North America, for example, right? So North America, uh, the majority of the people here were, um, were, were, were carbon-based beings, or copper-colored Indians, as by the American definition of the 1928 American Dictionary, copper-colored uh, people, the indigenous, indigenous people that are originally found here on this land, that are originally found here on this land, now is applied to the Europeans and their ancestors. And George Washington says that 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 must be uh, a patriotic statement. So. So you have you don't have any hostilities or anything. So there's no no need to say anybody's in any kind of trouble, anything like that. Then people come up to the shores, and again I'm making a long story short, and they start battling people. Right? They get over here, uh, they start digging for gold, they start using up people's stuff. Somebody says, "No, I man, I don't like what you're doing." Uh, well, we can be friends, and next thing you know, they're uh, chopping people up, eating them, and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> After they get them alive, right? You know, they're practicing cannibalism on themselves, and then they start practicing cannibalism on on the people that they uh, that were helping them. The other side, you know, the the indigenous people, they they don't like it too much, so they they band together and they begin to start fighting back. So the other side gets re re uh, reinforced, and they begin to start fighting harder, and they start killing people, lots of people, as they begin to start making their way in. <clears throat> to the mainland. And as they're making their way into the mainland, um, you have people, villages, that are being slaughtered. Right? That was one of the things about Thanksgiving and what they actually did to the, to the, to the people in Thanksgiving. They actually went over there and slaughtered a whole bunch of Indians and then went back and celebrated. So that's, that was the thing about Thanksgiving. So, so, for, so far right now, we don't have any prisoners of war because they're killing everybody. Right? They're killing, raping, and doing whatever they got to do. Children, women, whatever. They're killing everybody. Right? Um, as you get into this, <clears throat> they begin to start taking people. As they're fighting, they begin to start taking people and putting them into camps. So they start taking prisoners. So they start taking these prisoners, and they start taking them by the thousands and thousands and thousands as they're fighting and fighting and fighting. They're killing off way, way, way more people than they are taking in as prisoners of war. Right? So I think by 
1930, I meant 19, 1630, 1640, or something like that. Um, the Virginia colonies, they make up this rule stating that anybody that is caught as a, you know, caught, um, anybody that is taken in and, 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 and made a slave will be a slave for life. But actually, what they were talking about was anybody that was caught during this war that they had, they were going to take them in, make, put them in forced labor camps, and then make them work. So they did become indentured servants, right? Indentured servitude. They weren't indentured servitude. They were prisoners of war taken from their prisoner camps and forced into labor camps. Those labor camps is what you now call plantations. And there were many other different forms of... Um, of, of labor camps, right? You had camps where they had, you know, where they, were, you know, pig camps where they're, you know, making pigs or whatever. Uh, you had corn camps, whatever. It wasn't just cotton camps, but there was a lot of a lot of plantation camps, right? So they used slaves for a variety of different reasons, and then during the nineteen eight, I mean, sixteen sixties or whatever that was uh, that day, but it was in the sixteen hundreds, mid sixteen hundreds. They came up with the rule saying that they were going to make these prisoners of wars. Uh, slaves for eternity. So when we have a prison, when you get a prison of war, when you get a prison of war, and um, what happens is, is that you you can have that prisoner, you can make him do work, and then you can breed him, and his offsprings will become prisoners of war. And they put them into this prison of war type situation, which they call, which they which is now called slavery. They call it slavery. Right, but they were actually prisoners of war because they weren't sold into slavery. They weren't owned by anybody. They were free people fighting for their lives, fighting for their lands, fighting for their daughters, fighting for their mothers, fighting for their wives, fighting for themselves, fighting for their lives. And as I said in another, as I pointed out in another video, you know, they tried to kill all of us. They were trying to kill all of us, but they found a useful need for us at this point in time, which was labor. And again, part of being a prisoner of war is exploiting them for their labor. It's a definition. Right? So this is what they did. They, they, they came here. I mean, a whole lot of things happening. I'm just making it a real short situation. They came here, and then they started warring. And when they were warring, they were taking people, as, as they were killing off the masses, because you know they killed off over 100 million of us. And from my studies, the, the, what they call the Native Americans were the ones that were dying from smallpox, and all kinds of other viruses. There may have been a few of us that may have died from that, but I don't believe we were dying from any of those diseases. My belief is that they were outright slaughtering us. The reason why I believe that is because all the way up until this very day, really, they've been doing experimentations on our chromosome system, our DNA, on our carbon, what, we, what, what some people call melanin, but it's melanin, selenium melanin. It's more of a carbon melanin and not a sulfur-based melanin. It's a different melanin that they have in their system. Such a different melanin that they can't splice it with ultraviolet light at all. As they can do with sulfur-based um, melanin that doesn't have that carbon coating around the cells. Right? So when they were doing these testings and they're trying to splice the genes, they couldn't splice the genes of the so-called black person because the black person's nucleus was covered with a carbon-based melanin where they couldn't expose it to ultraviolet light. And when they tried to, what would happen is, is that it would diffuse into sound, sound waves, and diffuse. So our genome is, is protected. This is one of the reasons why we're extremely protected from the sunlight, right? We don't get sunburned and all that other type stuff. And we'll get into that another day with the carbon-7 uh, uh, carbon message, which is getting ready to come out. 
But us being prisoners of war, no, we weren't dying from a whole bunch of stuff because they were doing testing on our genome, on our systems, and our skin, right? Our organs to find out why we were so resistant to all of these different viruses, germs, and all that other type of stuff, why we really didn't get sick, right? This is the reason why they had segregated, and they were able to segregate us because we were prisoners of war. We had no say-so in this system. We had no say-so. So if they put us in a different ward and then chopped us and then and then spliced us or sent us out to different other wards in order for them to be able to do testing on us. We didn't know anything because they wouldn't tell us anything. They don't have to tell us anything as being a prisoner of war. You don't really have any rights. And at one point you didn't have any what you would call mankind rights because you weren't mankind. They didn't look at you as a man. They looked at you as an animal. And they had to look at you as an animal in order for them to be more superior than you. Because it was quite evident that when they came here, you were the most superior person on earth. Because again, as I pointed out in some of these other uh, programs, what they came here, they found the Hesperides. They found what they call paradise. The Garden of Eden had to be here. The place of the gods. Right? For so many different reasons. More pyramids here than anywhere else on earth. Right? There's more mound pyramids anywhere else on earth. Right? We did little shows on those as well. And by the way, um, I keep on forgetting. Please, right now, hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit it. Right? And then afterwards, share it with as many people as you can and tell them to hit that subscribe button. Right, it's ex extremely important uh, in order for us to be able to uh, make sure you know we're getting the word out um, and and helping us with um, us being able to uh, maintain the page, etc. You know, so thank you very much for that. Right, so prisoners of war. So this is what a that's what a prisoner of war is. This is what was happening. Right, so we got these prisoners of war, and now you know we don't we didn't have any rights. They took us, they were slaughtering us, and they were putting us in these concentration camps, right? Nance, I believe it was Nance, um, Nance, Alabama, right? The Punch Bowl, that's one of them, right? And they, I believe there were hundreds and, or maybe even thousands of them all around the country because they didn't know, where, they didn't know what to do with so many uh, former slaves and free black people as they were letting, as they were, uh, letting them loose out into a larger type of prison system. What do I mean by that? Well, for hundreds of years, they were slaughtering, killing our people. Hundreds of years. We had no rights. We had no say-so. We had nothing. Except for those that were making other deals with some very evil people. To keep their people safe, which means that they were selling their souls. They were still prisoners of war, even though they had a little better situation because some people say that they didn't know anything about slavery or anything about this war until about 1850, 1860. Right? Not many, but I did speak to some chiefs that said that their people didn't know anything about that. Right? So, there you have, in, in terms of what we call prisoners of war, right? People making side deals and all that other type stuff because now they're beginning to start entering into a larger type of prison system. Within the structural abuse system, it is the supremacist system and, and, and a lot of the supremacist system is based on white, white supremacy, right? That system was developing very, very, very largely but that white supremacy system also meant that it was a type of a jail system within the structural abuse system that made it so we didn't have any rights, no freedoms, nothing. Nothing. When it came down to the, um, you know, there was a guy, I believe it was in 1850-something, and he sued for his freedom. <clears throat> sued for his freedom. 
and it was the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott decision. And the Dred Scott decision told African Americans, they didn't use the term back then, but they told African Americans, black people, indigenous people, whatever you want to call them, that they could not, it would not be a part of this, of the United States um, system. They could not be citizens. The system wasn't meant for them. Anybody that was of a slave origin or that background could not be a citizen of the United States or any state. See, every state in the Union is its own separate country. People don't think of it that way. Every state in the Union is its own separate country. I think Texas is a, a confederation, right? And this is going to be important a little bit later on down as we're talking. Texas is a confederation. Uh, so the state of the state of um, New York, that's a country. New Mexico is a country. The state of Colorado is a country. You're getting my point, right? The state of Pennsylvania is a country. So every state, it's its own country, and and the Dred Scott decision said that um, no, the the any slave or freedman that is here in the United States or brought here into the United States as a slave cannot be part of the United cannot be a citizen of the United States. Could not be. Right? So out of the somewhat 300, 400,000 people over a 500, uh, over a 500 year period that came here in the United, in, in North America, those people could never be citizens of the United States. They don't have any rights to be a citizen of the United States, to be a citizen of any particular state, because the states can give out citizenship. Right? But you are a prisoner of war. And as a prisoner of war, you don't have a right to be a part of anyone's citizenship. Think about that. You are a prisoner of war. So with the Dred Scott decision, they're saying under normal conditions, you cannot be, under normal conditions, you cannot be a citizen of any state or a citizen of the United States, meaning that you cannot be a citizen of, of a state in itself. So if you're born in New York, you're not really a citizen of that state because they never granted you citizenship. And at that time, you wasn't a citizen of the, of, of the federal system of the United States. That didn't happen up until, I think, 1868 or something like that, 1866. That was a civil rights document there. So, it's important for you to understand your place. When you begin to start talking about all these acronyms and you begin to start talking about, you know, indigenous, you begin to start talking about aboriginal, you begin to start talking about, I'm an African. Right? You have to understand your place in the United States, in the United States system, right? So after 1960, after 1866, I think it was 66, they, they, you know, give it give or take a, a few years, all right? Give it take a few years. Do this off the top of my head. I don't have any notes in front of me. Um, you became a federalized uh, citizen of the United States backed by the federal system. 
because when they when when they when they did the proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, that didn't do anything but gave notice that they were going to end this type of prisoner system for no wages. Right? So the economic portion of it, the economic portion of it was over. That's what they were saying. They were making a, the federal government was making a business decision to go in a different direction because of the war. Right? So it's important for us to understand that, right? Because Lincoln wasn't Lincoln Lincoln wasn't ending that part of the prison system because he wanted to. He said, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't free any of these people. You know, if, if I really didn't have to, I wouldn't free any of these people. But if I do, I'm going to free them. I'm going to end this type of prison system. Right? Exploiting them for their labor. That's 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 what they ended. Right? So they were free to walk off the plantation, but they were still in occupied land. Which now we have to get into the land situation. Are you colonized? Because a lot of people are now talking about we were never colonized because we were at war. And we're still at war. Well, we got two things to that. And this is why we have to be very careful. Because when we say, you know, um, when we say, you know, we're, we're, we're certain people, just that and the other thing, we're, we're splintering ourselves all over the place. We're splintering ourselves all over the place. Right? And at this time, and at this time we can't be splintered. So even though they gave you a right to vote, <clears throat> which is only an act, no one who comes here in this country, if they're actually an African, an Indian from India, a German, anybody that comes here from anywhere else outside of the United States itself, outside of this United States North American system itself, has more rights than you do even though you were born on this land. And the reason why is because their system grants the rights for them to become citizens. See, they take a citizenship oath. When you were released, when our culture was released, when our people were released from the form of, of prison of war, of exploiting us for economic reasons, and let loose onto occupied land, which they were still warring on and taking over. They still own it, control it, right? They just let you loose into a bigger prison system. That's all they did. You never once took a right of citizenship. Never once. You don't have a birthright. You have a land right. You're here. And through the federal system, that's the reason why I tell people don't give away, don't you know, give up your uh, birth certificate, social security card, and all that other type of stuff because um, yeah, that's all you got. You don't got anything from the state. If you give that up, you got nothing, right? Until we get something for ourselves, which we're in this window to be able to do so. That's why we're having these conversations. That's why we're having this conversation. So understand that you, you are a prisoner of war on occupied land. Now, if you are a slave that was brought here from Africa, right? Those slaves that were brought here from Africa, what I found out, I found out, and this is crazy, what I found out that the slaves now now let me let me just back up this a little bit before I get into this part. I did a huge study on certain religious populations on certain reasons why they began attacking Africa and certain parts of the world. 
What were they looking for? What kind of people were they looking for? Who are they actually trying to root out and take over? What I found out is that they were after what you would call Hebrews. Now, what Hebrews means is that they were just, you know, um, they were copper colored people. They were us who actually, I believe, migrated over to the other side with a lot of our living principles and helped them to be able to rise up the people in that area. See, because maize was introduced into, into what you now call the African area, Ethiopian area, the people with burnt faces areas, right? Long before the pyramids ever raised up out of the ground. And what they found was maize, not corn, maize, which is a natural environmental uh, product from the Americas. Maize, corn. And when our people went over there, what they're theorizing is that our people went over there, the Atlanteans went over there, anti-Diluvian people went over there, people from North America, South America went over there, people from the Americas, because it's all one, the so-called Americas, you know, we have the real names and stuff like that, that this place is actually really called, but people from the Americas went over there, and they actually began to start teaching them how to cultivate maize, and that's when Memphis and a lot of these other types of places began to start sprouting up all over the place. Right, so you know, I know, I know a lot of people say, well, they had the Sumerian culture and this, that, and that's the oldest culture on earth and everything like that. Well, when you begin to start studying the North American culture, North American history, you begin to start taking a, a foot back, because you find out that the North American, that the American continents, the American continent, because it's all one landmass, from 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 from, and I, and, and also, you know, get this. The, what you call the polar regions, right? Antarctica, North Pole, right? South Pole, whatever. All of those were actually connected at one time to the landmass. So down there where Peru is, Peru is actually connected to Antarctica. Now, if you take a look at the map down there, you'll find that there was something that happened in the water where it would break, where, where, where something flooded or went over, earthquake or something like that, land mass shifted, and there was that land bridge that was there from Antarctica to Peru to South America um, was disrupted. So what happened is that so there was a lot of our people, I believe our people who are Hebrews, what they call themselves Hebrews, right now they're the Hebrews of today, I mean, it's a whole nother ball game because they're into all this religion stuff, right? It's a different type of, different type of Hebrew, all right? It's not this. It's it's a different type of Hebrew. I'm not going to get into it, but you know, for for the purposes, people call themselves Moors and stuff like that. The Moors are overrun by the uh, by by the Muslims again and again. They were after the same people, right? People of copper colored skin, right? And disrupted them and turned them into a mess. But anyway. Um, so what, what I found out is that the Africans, the, the people over there, didn't sell their own people into slavery. Who they were taking into slavery were the recycled, copper-colored people here in the Americas because the first slavery actually started back in the 1493, 1492, 1493, Whenever Columbus went back, he brought back with him 500 slaves. He brought back with him 500 slaves. And these 500 slaves were indoctrinated or introduced to the, um, to the Europeans. Look, look what we got here. Right? And remember, they were in the process of, of ethnic cleansing Europe at that point in time. So they took those prisoners of war, they took prisoners of war, captured them as he slaughtered hundreds and thousands of them, hundreds and thousands of people he slaughtered on those islands, and he brought back 500, 500 prisoners of war to Europe. And it became a practice of bringing these people back, right?
they were exotic or whatever you want to call them. Who knows? But they ended up making their way over to um, Africa as part of a, uh, another type of slave trade. And then as part of that slave trade, those, those people from Africa sold them back to the people here in the United States. So a lot of those 300, 400,000 people were actually people who originated here in this country in the first place. And that brings that number way down. Way down. Way down. That came from Africa. So the Africans were actually selling people who weren't of their quote-unquote tribes, weren't their people. They were selling foreigners. They were selling foreigners. Now, was it 100% foreigners? I'm not really sure, but I know they were selling a, a lot of the people that they were putting in, 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 in on those slave ships were foreigners. Right, and this is one of the reasons that why they went into Africa in the first place, because they went into Africa to try to wipe out a certain group of people. Then, when they began, then I guess you know the powers that be above them told them, you know, be specific and wipe out these people. Right, so that's that whole entire thing. So then they come over here, right? Whatever, and. You know, when you begin to start saying descendants of African slaves and this, that, and the other thing, they don't have any rights, according to Dred Scott, in terms of any of the states and anything like that. Federally, they got citizenship. Federally. But you have to remember something. You had to, you had to agree to involuntary servitude in order for you to agree consciously in this citizenship, but not one person. And if I'm wrong, please write, write me, email me, let me know if anybody in your family ever took a citizenship test or a citizenship oath. And from my studies, because <clears throat> my background is political studies, right? Political investigations, etc. Uh, international political studies and all that other type of stuff. But from, from my background, from what I know, I don't know of any prisoner of war that be, actually was able to become a citizen of that country. So we are still prisoners of, of, at war at the mercy, at the mercy, the, the total and complete mercy of this system. Some people call it a white supremacist system. I can see why they call it that. I call it a supremacist system. You know, geared towards white supremacy inside of a structural abuse system which is encapsulating everything else. And that's because I feel that they had a lot of help doing everything that they've done. People say, how in the world did they get so powerful to destroy us like this? Because they had help. When Columbus came over here, uh, it was shown that it, there was all kinds of lights in the skies. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the ocean. Uh, what we call them now are, um, are UFOs or submersible UFOs. USOs, right? Um, we had people, <clears throat> Alexander, when he was running around conquering the world from Europe, right? When he was running around slaughtering a whole bunch of people, he was being guided by some sort of a ship. And all of your religious writings and all your paintings, they are referred to um, ships in the sky. And in fact, some real, uh, uh, some, um, some, some, some paintings actually show these uh, these battles taking place in the sky. And these battles are happening again, but those will be talked about during our Carbon 7 type situation, or the, the, the conversion of that. So, so prisoner of war is what you are. Black people are prisoners of war. So-called black people are prisoners of war. I don't care if you call yourself a Negro. I don't care if you call yourself colored. And colored is probably better because that's the original definition they came up with. 
copper colored beings, copper colored people. But colored, copper colored, you know, dark skin, black, Negro, that, that beautiful word that people call each other, the N word all the time. Negro, whatever that is, it's associated with some sort of a, not, not something that's not so good. But there were uh, people over there, I think, in China that were called negative people or something like that. There, um, there's a lot of weird stuff going on with that word. A lot of weird stuff. But because of the social connotation that's behind it, I encourage people not to use that word. Right? But if somebody we, if somebody wants to be called that, then, I mean, you have to call people what they want to be called, right? So, certain areas. But anyway, people are in that mode because they are prisoners of war. Right? That's what they are. That's what they are. You're also a prisoner of war because um, what they did with the Buffalo Soldiers was that they conscripted a lot of the soldiers that they were fighting against into their war. And what they did there, they turned their they turned our own people against us, the Buffalo Soldiers, and they began and that's that's when they that's with like the tale of trios and all that and all that other type stuff. It was the Buffalo Soldiers that were going around um killing all that stuff. I think it was doing that I think they were doing that for Andrew Jackson or something like that, right? But because we, we are prisoners of war and occupied land, we have no choice. Some people make that choice to go to the other side because they can live better. Well, what are you going to do in jail? Right? In jail, everybody's looking for a job because you got to have a job, some sort of a job. They tell you you have to have a job. Even today, you got to have a job. Right? So that was their job. That's what they knew what to do. They were good at it. So instead of getting killed, they went and they killed their own people and opened up the West for the Americans, for, for the Europeans, right? And when it came down to the war, the Californians, what they did, they used the prospectors, right? They used private militia. That's another code word for private militia. They sent the private militias over there and offered the private militia, I think it was 5 to $10 a head. And they were killing millions. So the gold was the palette of the hair of the head. They were scalping people because a scalp was proof that how many people they killed. So as a prisoner of war, you only have the rights of the belligerent party, in this case, the United States government. In past cases, it was Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, And a whole bunch of other people. Germans are over here as well. I don't think the Russians are over here, but the Germans are over here. Right? A whole bunch of people over here. People from Holland, they are over here. Do all kinds of crazy weird stuff, right? Um, yeah, so you have absolutely no rights, really, as a prisoner of war, other than the rights they say that you have, but they can take it away from you at any particular time because they can take your life at any particular time. And they're not really supposed to get in any trouble for it. Right? It's now that we're entering into this age of, of Aquarius that a lot of things are waking up and there's a lot of things that they know they can get away with and they cannot get away with because people are, are waking up. But there's still a lot of people sleeping. So if you think that you are free in this system, you're not. If you think you're not a prisoner of war in this system because you're doing well, you're not. Anybody who is involved in this system that is of a connotation or name that is called black, African-American, African, whatever, African, uh, descendant of slaves, indigenous, aboriginal, anybody who's of that, of that persuasion is a prisoner of war. In a white supremacist or supremacist system encapsulated in a structural abuse system, structural violence system, which controls it all. See, the supremacist system is really bad because the supremacist system is how the jail is run. The jail is run on this on the supremacist system, geared towards giving a certain people, a certain populace, an advantage. And when you're in this type of system, what happens is, is that what they do, what they make you do as a prisoner, they make you work towards the benefit 
of the system. So everything that you do, everything that you say, everything that you see, every piece of music that you hear, everything that you hear, everything that you that is allowed to be in the airwaves, visual waves, or any, anything like that, is geared for you to support this system. Right? As soon as you begin to start deviating and really making some sort of a headway and 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 going against the system and making the system weaker, they will take action against you. So in a prison of war system, if you lose your job, right? If you lose your job, see how you're doing really well everything is good, and you lose your job, who are you actually going to go for a job? You have to go to somebody who has some connections with a white person in order for you to be able to get hired to another job. Because only white people in this system control all the industries. Dr. Claude Anderson, he constantly points this out. And I said, we got to listen to our elders. Listen to them. Because he's only telling the truth. From the time you were released out of slavery, you own just as much as a collective of people as you own right now. You don't own any industries, and you really don't own any real businesses. There's one business that's over there, I think it's in Pennsylvania somewhere, that's doing really well. Billionaires, whatever the situation is, right? But again, they're in the system. So they can take that away from you any time that they want. Oh, come on, brother. Brother McLean, you know, brother, I knew this is crazy. This is crazy. You know, you're talking this racist stuff. You know, if, if, if you do what you're supposed to do, then, you know, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, if you do what you're supposed to do and they, and they you know, they like you, yeah, you can make it anywhere if they allow it. If they allow it. Look what happened to the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party started out as a peaceful organization providing services. They were providing more services for lunches and breakfasts than the whole entire United States government at one point. They couldn't have that. That wasn't supporting the system. So you're still in their system. You're still a prisoner of war. You're dependent on them. If you lose your job, you're dependent on them to get another job. You have to go to them for the job. I don't care how educated you are or how non-educated you are. Right? There's always going to be, at the very, very, very top, a white person. And I hate to say that, but it's true. A white person who is going to decide whether or not if you're going to work. You've got to ask permission from the system who is controlled by them. You have no power in the system. That's why there's a lot of people who ended up in jail today because they think they got some power. They ain't got no power. Right? They find themselves behind jail. Right? And even in the white supremacist system, as you've seen just the other day, they'll put their own people in, in jail for life. For going against their own system because they have a code. Right? It's like a mafia code. And that mafia code is if, if you buck, buck the system, then we're going to come for you and take you for a car ride. Right? I mean, it's like what they did with the, um, um, in, in a lot of these mafia movies, right? You go against the system, we'll take you for a car ride. That's what it is. You're a prisoner of war. You have no rights. Yeah, I got rights. I got voting rights. Is it? Yeah, if they keep on, if they keep on passing that voting rights act. But you are an aboriginal, an indigenous person who they brainwashed you into thinking that you were someplace else or from someplace else. Some some people are, but there's only 2% of the people. I'll give you four. That's not many, that's not much people. Right? That's not many people. So when, when they got your brainwashed, and again, part of being in the prison system Right? Is that they demonstrate military victory over you by punishing the people that they are at war with. They prosecute them for prisoners of war crimes. So anytime that somebody had stepped up to try to do anything that's positive for the people, they 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 deal with them. 
They, they, they conscripted people for their war effort, Buffalo soldiers and a lot of other soldiers in World War I, World War II, etc. They, they use an indoctrinating system, and every single one of our people right now are indoctrinated into the system. Right? And you're really indoctrinated into the system because you're not like the regular people who are indoctrinated and you feel good about yourself. You feel proud about yourself. You're proud about where you came from. Ask any white person, where did you come from? I come from France. Yeah, I love Napoleon. Powerful man. I come from Italy. My descendants of people from Rome. Right? I'm from Britain, from royalty. I'm from Sweden, Russian, whatever, China, Japan, all of these places, right? They have culture. But then when you come down to you and you're being indoctrinated, they say, where you're from? Uh, you know, they show you a little picture in the book. You're a, pig, you're a pygmy from Africa or something like that. You were brought over here on these slave ships. You have absolutely no kind of spiritual or soulful power whatsoever. Nothing for you to build yourself up on until you begin to start finding out what the truth is. This is the reason why they did not allow prisoners of war to read or write. To study anything. It takes about 50 to 100 years to completely begin to start eradicating uh, people's mindsets. Right? Prisoners of war get sexually abused. A lot of our people were buck broken. Men. They were taken right in front of their families and friends if they weren't listening right in front of their wives the people that they have children with and they get sexually abused to the point as to where they can't even they can't even breathe basically right and they tell the women this is what's going to happen to you psychological abuse that is structural abuse of some of the most worst kind i mean but the, i mean the structural violence is even is even worse, and that's why I say there's a structural bias that's encapsulating this this whole entire um, uh, supremacist system, right? And I don't constantly say white supremacy because I know that the supremacist system that they had developed did not come from them; it came from somewhere else. They had help, a lot of help, because at one point they were almost wiped off the face of the earth. They had a lot of help. All right, the people that came over here were were diseased. They were unable to really to have babies, right? So when they started having babies with the people here, and infusing, drinking their blood, that's where all this vir vampirism stuff like that comes from. Because they need the prisoner of war. They need their genetics in order for them to help solve a lot of the problems that are going on with them today, right? And when we begin to start talking about the carbon-7 beings, the carbon-7 from carbon-12 to carbon-7, you'll begin to start understanding why they need a lot of this stuff, right? You begin to start understanding why a lot of these different places need a lot of stuff. And even we, I mean, even we as people of, of what you call color, people black, whatever the situation is, we, we as well, because we're in danger of being wiped out ourselves, yeah, there's a lot of people running around here, oh, you know, they're going to pay for what they've done, this, that, and the other thing. But if you don't get yourself in a mentally correct, a spiritually correct, a soulfully correct situation, you will not be able to make the transition. This is the reason why you need to understand that you are a prisoner of war. And when people begin to start bringing out all these different acronyms, is to get the prisoners to fight against each other. So then when they end up going to the table again, They get some crumbs that fall off the side, some fat back, some chitlins, pig feet, liver from a chicken, and you think you got something, right? It's abuse. They're setting you up for a big thing, and that's why you are a prisoner of war because you have you're you're in you're 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 encaged. And there is no help for you in here other than for you to do whatever you need to do. So that's why as a prisoner of war, you cannot really go against anybody for doing whatever they have to do to be able to try to survive in this prison system. Anybody. 
Right? You can't because you can't. I can't say nobody can say I'm holier than thou, and you know I, I I live on the top floor of the prison, and you live on the bottom floor of the prison. Man, those doors close. You are in prison. You still have to go to the same people to deal with whatever you got to deal with, and if you get out of hand, um, they they will shoot you down in your prison suit. And your prison suit is your skin color. When you're born, you are in prison. You're already in prison. Right? So they ended slavery, what you call slavery. They ended the economic portion of it. What they did was then they released those people who were in economic um, 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 camps, free labor camps. They just opened those. They just opened that up and just let them go. But where did they actually go? They just went into the larger, the other parts of the prison. They were in one prison area doing specific work. So what they did, they opened up those jail doors of of of, of the plantation and let them migrate out into the other areas of the prison for the first time, on their own. And if you think that, you know, you can overcome a lot of this stuff without doing the right thing, without selling your soul and all this other type of stuff, without getting out from under this prison system, let me talk about Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street, as many of you probably remember, was the first time that American, that, that bombs fell on America from the air. Black Wall Street, they had over 600 businesses. They had their own airport. People, they had people with air, who owned airplanes. They had their own bus company, their own bus system, their own educational system. They had their own legal system going in over there. They even were developing their own stock market. That's why they call it Black Wall Street. They relied on black infrastructure. They had black farms that they were buying their, 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 their uh, uh, injury, their, their food from and everything. They, they had everything over there that you needed to have. Their own churches and everything. They dressed like Americans, they looked like Americans, but they were indigenous people who knew what they were, they were proud, they were doing, putting everything together. They had buildings on buildings, it was a beautiful place, and they bombed it down to the ground. They burnt it, bombed it, and shot the people in there and killed over 3,500 people, threw a lot of them in the river. That's what they did. So just when you think that you got economic prosperity going, they can take it away from you just like that. Just like that. You have no power. You only have the power of the illusion of the power that they give you. You have no power. It's a person who made a phone call the other day and she says, you know, they were after me on my job. They were after me. They were trying to write me up and do all kinds of stuff, right? And they gave me a faulty evaluation and then they put me on the investigation because I questioned it. She said that then they said that, you know, we, you might not, we may not bring you back. Uh, uh, we may not bring you back in the other, uh, on the other side, on the other school year because she was a school teacher. So she resigned her position, but she had to finish out the year. So she needed uh, uh, she needed some recommendations. So she was asking the question, who do I go for the recommendation? Because if I go back to them, they're going to give me a bad recommendation. And she said she already did go back to them. And what they did, they said that they're going to give her an, another recommendation. <clears throat> and they sent her right back to the person who did the faulty evaluation on the, uh, to begin with. She had nowhere to go. The only thing she can do is go beg the system for a good evaluation. Where can I go? She had to go back to the system and ask, where can I go to get a good evaluation? Our jobs and everything is all dependent on that. So don't fool yourselves. We are prisoners of war. That's what it is. And if anybody can prove any different, that our classification should actually be prisoners of war, who are forced to go into free labor camps, please email me, you know, subscribe and make a comment. Let me know where I'm wrong at. Really, let me know. Black people, African American people, indigenous people, aboriginal people were all prisoners of war. We have all different types of status. 
But we all are prisoners of war in this system. And we can't, all of us can't do anything until we're out of this prison of war. This is the reason why I say we have to, and again, decolonization is part of, is this part of the process because there's a lot to go along with that. Because it's, cause, um, people who are prisoners of war technically can't be colonized. They're prisonerized. Right, so when the war is, and we have to end the war, we have to decolonize, right? And then we, when the war is ended, we decolonize. Then we're able to talk about restitution. We're able to talk about reparations. But it has to come to us as a collective. And that as individuals. And the last thing I want to really bring up is that everything in this world now is about individualism. It's about making myself great, making myself good, this, that, and the other thing. Which, well, yeah, I mean, you got to work on yourself. You got to work on yourself. You, you do have to work on yourself. But it's very interesting that everything that you, when you need to do something, it's not about the individual, it's about the collective that pushes it forward. See, as an individual in their Congress, you can't get anything done. So you can work on yourself from day to night for the next 50 years, but you won't get anything done just working on yourself, talking to yourself, doing whatever you're doing, right? You need other people to be able to go in concert with you. You need other people to be able to, 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 to help obey by the universal laws that are around you. You need other people to help with that intent. Because by yourself, you can't do it. Now, if you're in a situation where, you know, everybody's getting ready to get slaughtered and this, that, and the other thing, which, you know, it might, it might come a day where that's coming, you, know, you better work on yourself and diss yourself and just make sure that you're right so then that way you can get through that process as best as possible. Right? If you don't understand what kind of process I'm talking about, take a look at a slaughter farm. Look how they kill the beef. These pigs chickens right you're going in there as an individual going in there on your own right this is the reason why you need to know how to meditate and how to pray and get yourself as an individual what our responsibility as an individual is to make sure that we have our system cleansed so then that way we're able to download the information from the sun and the other atmospheric things that are around us so that we can have the intentions inside of us known as to what we're supposed to be doing as a collective and where we're supposed to be going. Anything else that we're doing right now is, is faulty. It has to be ending the war first. When you end the war, what happened is, is that every Aboriginal indigenous person that was here on this land first has to be repatriated back into their own land. Right? Have to be repatriated back into their own land. When you decolonize, right, you're actually giving those people who were colonized under the American system and just that and the other thing, right? Um, you're actually giving them the opportunity to be uh, repatriated back into their own land. And those two things have to happen first before you can even begin to start talking about uh, a recompense. Or reparations. Period. Right? And the only way that we're able going we're going to be able to do this is that we're all going to have to do it together. We're going to have to have a very large confederation come together and fight for it together. And then once all of our conditions are met and we have our own governmental process in, in, in place, and again, the governmental process only means a framework in a way as to where you can get the remedy to our own people. Because when we were on this land before, I believe we just had frameworks, systems, and we had, um, we had an understanding on how we were supposed to be living with one another. And it all worked out very naturally, very nice, and very beautiful. Because we were very beautiful people, very proud people. We lived very, very, very righteously, very, very magnificent lives. We were very clean, orderly people. 
Right? We, we smoked our weed and our tobacco. Well, when I say now tobacco, we use the tobacco leaves to smoke the herbs. And the Europeans never seen that before before they came here. Other cultures did because other cultures were over here trading with us. But yes, to end this segment out, we are prisoners of war. Black people are prisoners of war. That's what we are. And, you know, whether you call yourself Aboriginal, Indigenous, Indian, um, American Indian, Native Indians, Native Americans are totally something totally different. That's the reason why you were not involved in any of that stuff. But the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1968 explained it all, really. Really laid down a whole big thing. I mean, read it. Just don't talk about it. You got people out there making speeches, making videos, and all kinds of stuff. Never read the 1968 um, Civil Rights Act. I would recommend that you go to Phoenix Moon's page, listen to her as she reads it. Listen to it. If you don't want to read it, just listen to it as you're driving. Put it on while you're driving. In America, there's free internet everywhere you go, right? You ain't got to pay for it. Just put it on while you're driving in your car. Listen to Phoenix Moon as she's breaking down the 1968 Civil Rights Act and who it was actually for. And we got all the makings and all the pieces of putting our confederation together. We have it all there. But if we're acting in a separate mode, if we're acting as separate beings, and if we're acting that we're better than this and better than that, then we'll be better than nothing because we're all going to end up in the same fate. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be making this conversion, which is my big thing. That's my thing. That's why I'm out here trying to do what I'm trying to do because people's, people's, people's eternal souls are at stake right now. People's eternal souls are at stake right now. And when I do the Carbon 7 show, you'll, you'll have an understanding as to why. You'll have an understanding. Well, we'll have Elder Carl on one more time. We'll have um, Sister Bryant, my mom, she wants to come on and say a few things, right? Some elder people, I'm trying to get the elders on here. There's um, elders in Colorado that I can get to come on, right? Um, I want to try to get some, some of those brothers over there from Philadelphia back on the show again, Red Tail. I want to try to get him on. Um, I also, it's time now to get Nubin Minkari's on. There's a lot of developments going on with him and the uh, Bright Race, right? Uh, you see a lot of those uh, comments and stuff like that being posted on the Facebook page, right? I want to do a, uh, a specific interview with Kerry Davis. Buck Wild. I'm going to try to get that done. All right? He's got that great book, that great ebook that's out there. Go to his, go to his um, African Americans and Africans, and and buy that ebook. Buy it, right? Um, Daughters Divine. That's a great group out there that's giving out a lot of religious instruction. And I would say religious instruction, spiritual instruction for women. Go over there, donate, and um, support. Support. Right? Support these people. Phoenix Moon, she's out there. She's doing a lot of stuff. I mean, she's really deep. She's doing a lot of good stuff. Support those people. The Cruise Nation, they're really doing a heck of a lot of work in terms of all the all the groundwork that's going on in terms of how we're able to get ready for this decolonization and all this other type of stuff that's going on. They're doing a heck of a lot of work over there. Support our people. Support. Right? Support our people over there in Georgia. Right? Support our people. Everywhere that you know, there's, there's, there's a group up in um I'm gonna have a show and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a show just about support, right? Of all the different groups and stuff like that are out there because as a collective we are worth 1.6.8 trillion dollars. That's cool. There's no reason why any of us are walking around here work. Sad. Depressed. Lonely. Tired. 
Not at all. Life is great. Life is great. Life is beautiful. And I'm glad that we're living in the abundance that we are. And the abundance is coming to me right now. And I really do appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the people who are subscribing to our inner live, our inner soul channel. And getting a sense of this infinite universe that we're in. So dive deep into this infinite universe. Dive very deep into the infinite universe and come up breathing the good air. Come up and just loving yourself and loving the environment that is around you and loving your people. I love you. This is Ronnie.